Hey, this is Jason Alon from a band called Let Live, and you're listening to Louder. So I'm here with Jason Alon Butler yes. of Let Live. Yes, sir. How are you doing, man? Doing well, yeah. Cold, but... In England? Yeah, no. No, I know. It's, it's a phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Never happens. <laughs> Never happens. So... I think many interviews, the research for the interviews, start mm. with Wikipedia. So yeah. I went to your Wikipedia page. <laughs> and it says that you're known, okay? Butler is known for smashing on stage objects. Yeah, yeah, a couple that's times. That's your thing. Yeah, that's a thing. I, I never really intended it uh, for it to be that, but it ended up, uh, I guess, finding its way into my stage antics. And I guess it's been fairly consistent. So it might be my thing. Yeah, could be. Okay, and if I'm saying you're already not allowed on some venues yeah yeah Can also stop you from joining some tours yeah we we've been <laughs> yeah we, we've definitely gotten um admonished for a couple of things that we've done but we always seem to try to sort it out uh this venue actually we got in a lot of trouble for i, I think i climbed something or jumped off something so but we're here we're back you know what i'm saying so they can't be uh very long-standing um uh barring bars for us so i think we're all right I was thinking, you don't describe yourself as the singer of the band, yeah, yeah, but the yeah. instigator? Yeah, more so an instigator, yeah, yeah. So, what do you start? What do you instigate? I'm t hoping some sort of um, subversive or alternative thought uh, in the front end, and then perhaps maybe some, uh, like a physical adaptation of, of what I'm thinking uh, presented onto stage, and, and hope to just sort of spark uh, challenging and confronting feelings and thoughts for people, not, not to make them uncomfortable, which is clearly what happens, but more so just to get them to perhaps think a little bit more uh, beyond than you know just what's in front of them at that moment with like the music and the scenario, but beyond that, something they can leave with and then sort of uh, you know I guess think about. Yeah. So do you see yourself as some sort of a social activist? I would like to be. Yeah. I mean, every one of my uh, I guess I've never really had anyone that I consider a uh, an idol, but um, if I were to I guess uh, classify something or someone as that they've all been um, social activists uh, societally uh, affecting change and you know anything similar to that so yeah I'd like to believe so but I guess self-proclamation is a little arrogant so I'll just let people decide did somebody already come up to you and told you that you're a role model in some way um I've heard you know things like that before yeah I, I'm not necessarily I don't know, I think that in a, in a band you kind of have to assume that once you get to a certain point in your career that that, uh, I guess, the that idea does sort of come inherently. Uh, a, some people don't even, even if, whether you want it or, or not, it just sort of shows up. And you should be self-aware and you should be aware of the things that surround you um, and in your environment as a performer. So I'm aware that that could be a possibility and in doing so I want to make sure that I always demonstrate what I think is the best presentation of myself and as a human being, as, as a person. So uh, whether I am or I'm not, I'm always going to be on my P's and Q's with being a, a good person, trying to be. So what do you think gets more people to follow you? Is it your onstage persona or your lyrics? That's a great question. Um, I'd have to say probably just a, in a, a combination of the two, probably a marriage of the two. I would, I would hope so, yeah. So the lyrics are going to get people to think, and right. your onstage persona is going to get people to put stuff in their mouth. Yeah, 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 basically, that's it. So what do you have to say about being PC? Is it something you follow or you go against? I, I believe I believe that the, the term PC has been stigmatized as of recent. I think that people think that it's something that uh, limits us or um, creates like some sort of cumbersome uh, scenarios when we want to say something, but for, but for me, uh, a lot of the PC terms are necessary. I think what they actually are doing are, are uh, dismantling the status quo, normalcy, everything from heteronormative behavior to uh, you know racial issues to intellectual issues. I think that there's a lot of terms that need to be recognized just as any sort of diction or syntax has been recognized throughout, especially the English language. We are constantly uh, adding new words or um, or, or uh, connotations to literal, like you know, literal phrasing to colloquialisms. I think I think that being PC, like I said, ha it's like a dirty word right now, especially in America because of um, you know disgusting displays of humanity such as Donald Trump. Uh, but 
No, I think people should pay attention to what they say and how they say it. Uh, I really do. And, I, and I'm one to, I, I've got a very big mouth and I say a lot of things and sometimes I even need to go back and think about what I've said and what I meant when I said it. So I just really enjoyed this topic. So yeah. I'm going to continue that. Sure. Um, so would you say that PC is there to help people not be offended or to kind of turn things into taboos and then limit the conversation? I think that there, it's not even so much that we're, we should focus on not just offending, but we should just start understanding their other scenarios so that we don't even have to worry about being offensive. So for me, I would like to be able to understand, maybe empathize, because you know, uh, commiseration and empathy are things that are required uh, for us to continue as a species. I think that we need to understand each other. Um, and on the forefront of all of it, something that sort of surpasses all of the, the worry. I think that's the problem. I think people are worried about offending, uh, which they should be, but more so, or before that, I feel that they should try to be understanding. Therefore, when they choose the words to describe someone or descriptors to describe someone or a scenario, they should consider that person before just the offense. You know, these are people we're talking about, and I think that's what we're doing is we're removing the idea of, of personhood and removing the idea of, we're, we're almost dehumanizing people at times when we, when we don't want to, you know, when we're worried about what, what words to use. When in reality, we should just be considering. We should be considering how we're describing this human being. Um, so, like I said, PC. I'm with it. You you should think about what you're saying to somebody all the time. You know what I'm saying? Like that's just that's just the reality of things. It's not it's not something that the government tried to create for us to. Uh, you know, to keep us down or quiet. It's actually something that the people have chosen to embrace and implement in order to describe other people. I think it's necessary. Yeah. And if I'm mistaken, in the past, you've mentioned that growing up, you were told to kind of avoid sadness and vulnerability. Mm, yeah. Um, is it something that kind of goes against what you believe in right now? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Um, it's a patterned way of thinking, and it's certainly been ingrained in my, uh, you know, my sort of social DNA, the way that I interact with other people. Uh, vulnerability is not something that I wear um, overtly in my personality, but I don't believe that being vulnerable or being sad or feeling the things that you, we feel as a, as a mode of beings with frontal lobes, you know, with brains, I think that you should feel those things and I'm trying every single day to learn how to feel them properly, how to express myself, how to um, decompartmentalize everything that uh, I've sort of I partitioned in my brain and in my heart and, and logic and emotion and kept them so far separate. I'm trying to find some sort of um, conduit, you know, to, 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 so they can meet. So, yeah. Are you familiar with existentialism? Yes. Are you a big supporter of one of their themes, the main themes, which is uh, pain and suffering leads to enlightenment? Yes. So everything that made you suffer in the past, just something to push you forward? Yeah, yeah, I, I believe, I really do. And not, not like a, like a, I'm not like a, like a sycophant or like, you know, like I'm, I'm not trying to sit here and, and tell everyone, yes, 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 I believe you're right. And I believe it because I want to be told, thank you. It's that, it's, it's more so like, I think that, I think it's necessary. I think uh, the human condition, we, we cannot truly understand or believe what it is to be happy unless we know what it is to be sad and, and it's so cliched and trite especially coming from an artist you know it's, it's always people always say these things because they've read it somewhere some sort of proverb you know that they got from a fortune cookie or something um, but no I, I truly believe that um, alongside existentialism you know I think that there's this idea of absurdism um, that sort of predated uh, the existential existential movement and and in that it was just sort of under, it's like sort of us assuming that we know what this all means is, a, is rather arrogant. It's absurd, you know, uh, which is... So for me, I think that there's this, this huge necessity in feeling multiple, multiple facets of emotion. And, and one of those ones for me is now uh, understanding my sadness and identifying it properly as opposed to just calling it anger and then uh, pushing it aside when I just get aggressive. Yeah. Do you think about it while it happens or a few days afterwards? Just enjoying been, that pain. I've been trying to do it while it's happening now. I've got, a, I've got an extremely supportive wife who is extremely emotionally uh, adept. She's got a wide scope and spectrum of emotions and understands them and, 
can sort of discuss them. She can articulate them quite well, so she's teaching me a lot about that. Um, every day, every single day, even when I'm not with her. Like, you know, last night we, we had a conversation just about how she was feeling and then I talked about how I was feeling and, and in the end we both felt better because we were both able to discuss something that typically we might not be able to with just anyone. So, um, I'm just, I'm lucky. Every day I think that I'm very lucky to have her and, and my mom was, you know, very emotionally in tune. Uh, she was a huge part of my life growing up. My sister and my mother were very, very big parts of my life. And I think that generally, and this is scientifically speaking, and it could be disproven, and, but as of right now, the general consensus, consensus is that the female's emotional horizons uh, typically evolutionarily are just more vast than ours. Um, and because, nice. you know, yeah, than then, then, then men, yeah. So I really, really do appreciate that. Even, you know, in my own feminism, um, I believe that women, will save the world. Like, I think that that's what we need more of is understanding that women have this capacity that we've sort of, whether we have it or not as men, we've definitely tried to mute it or extinguish it in order to be more powerful, which I think is probably the wrong thing to do. I've got to ask about the next generation of the Butler family. Yeah. Okay. I know that in the past you said that you want to have kids. Yeah. But being a musician, your wife is also a musician. Yeah. And I know that your dad was not around yeah. when you were growing up because mm -hmm. it was a musician. Yeah. Are you scared of that as well, giving your kids the same experience you got? Yeah, no. No, I think that I've learned so much from it. And also, as a musician, at this point, who's been, you know, I've been through so much and I've been so many places and met so many people and experienced so many things. Personally, I know what to do now. I get it. And that's why I'm ready to have children. You know, like next year we want to start trying to have children and I'm, and I'm very much equipped, uh, ready and excited to do so and make sure that they are you know, they get everything they need from me, from my wife, and they can be a part of this too. Like, we can definitely make them a part of this thing, this crazy world that is, you know, uh, music. So you shouldn't scare your fans about the future of the band? Um, nah, nah I, think, I think it's just life. You know, I think that the evolution of Let Live is a very transparent one, and I think that we will always uh, let people know what we're doing and why we're doing it because uh, they deserve it, you know? And, and also we deserve as human beings, um, not just as artists or, or performers or a band, but we deserve um, a little bit of opportunity to do things that may fulfill us in other ways that the band cannot. So children is one for me, yeah. So I'm finally gonna ask something about your music. Yeah. But you guys are so political, so I had to ask mm -hmm. all those questions. But If I'm the Devil was released just a few months ago, yeah. um, and I know that renditions, a lot of people ask about renditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is it gonna come back, or should yeah. we wait for another album and then renditions? I'd like to do it, I'd like to start next year. It was simply just a project that we um, started so that we could basically pick it up whenever we wanted, and I would like to think that next year we'll have some time to start creating even more creative collaborations and or ideas for renditions, so. Yes, it will come back during this album cycle, almost definitely. I don't want to say definitely yet, but I'm pretty sure it will. Yeah. So is the aim the entire album being just regenerated? That would be cool. Yeah, well, I, I would like to do that. Uh, I think we should probably do something along those lines, unless, and then I, unless like a song from an, another album someone picks, you know, like another artist is like, I actually want to do this. And then I, I would say, yeah, sure. You know, final deep question. Yeah, we're gonna end up on a deep note. Uh, but between what's happening in the U.S., the election that just ended a few weeks ago, yeah, and Brexit that's yeah. here in the U.K., and musicians touring the world and maybe abolishing borders, yeah, um, are you guys talking about starting your own kind of artistic nation, anti-nation nation? Yeah, I mean, I guess a sense of sovereignty through through art would be fantastic, wouldn't it? Where we can kind of have our own uh, annex. In, in this world. I think that's what we've always been trying to do though, isn't it, as artists. I think that we've never really felt fully uh, a part of the, of the status quo or, or the sense of normal behavior, ideas, ideologies with the rest of the world. So we've created these wonderlands and, and a sort of neverland idea with, with music. So to answer your question, yeah, I definitely think that we are going to do that, but I also think that's what we've been doing specifically with Let Live is trying to create a forum for people to exist in 
where otherwise they, they, they couldn't feel comfortable. You know, if you can't feel comfortable at home or you can't feel comfortable walking down the street or you can't feel comfortable in these uh, typical, let's say, settings, whether it be your work or school or, you know, these are very, very, I guess, um, commonplace things that most people don't consider being a bit uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, degrading sometimes for for the for the actual soul, like who you really are. I think that we've always we're always being put in some sort of box that we don't fit in. At some point in our life, everyone will be placed into some box that they don't necessarily fit in, and this box that we're going to create is a much more malleable one and form fitting for whoever wants to be a part of it. So yeah, yeah, hell yeah! I think that we'll definitely create something like that, or at least give our absolute best to do so. So I have to ask about one of your boxes. Yeah. Um, you have a side project, Girl, yeah. Gentlemen's in Real Life. Yeah, yeah. What is a gentleman? What's the box that a gentleman should fit into? I think that the idea of a, a to your typical gentleman is antiquated and archaic. I think that what it is is a, is a frame of mind, and it's to be put simply in layman's terms is doing the right thing. Uh, subjectively, of course, like what you think is the right thing, you must always consider what that means to someone else. I think that's the biggest thing about being a gentleman. And, and the reason that, uh, you know, gentlemen in real life, acronymically, it reads girl. And that was intentional so that we could take this gender binarism and sort of just get rid of it. We don't, we don't want to focus on just being a men's brand or just being a women's brand, but finding a, a unisexual, you know, I guess, omnisexual sort of um, approach to everything we do and also an offering for everyone and anyone that wants to be a part of Gentlemen in Real Life. That's what we're creating. We're creating like um, a uniform, a flag, a representation. So if you buy something from Gentlemen in Real Life, you're actually supporting an idea rather than just like consuming the products we make, uh, which we don't necessarily, we haven't started, we don't make Let's just, it's not capitalistic. If, you know, I mean, of course it is in a way that we have to make profits in order to continue making you know, uh, our items, but we're not, we're definitely not making the money that most of these other companies are making uh, because they're trying to convince consumers to buy their product. That's not what we're at. We just want people to think. And then if that's something you believe in, if that's an ideal that you want to be a part of, then you can purchase an item or you can get an item somehow. You can procure an item however you, you can and, and represent that idea, I think. And it's not just men at all. I think that women are the ones that taught me how to be a gentleman, which I think is the most um, important thing about all this, is understanding um, the duality of everything, but also the contingent and our most congruent piece, which is the opposite. You know, I'm one thing, this is the opposite, so. Okay, Jason of Red Left, anything else you wanna to add to fan and listeners? Just thank you. I always say it. Just thank you. Thank you for thank you for the questions. Thank you for prompting a discussion such as this. And I hope that for those that are, you know listen this far, I know that I can be verbose and seemingly hyperbolic, um, but I mean it. I really mean it all. And I hope that you know you feel something from just this conversation. And if you want to have more of them, find me. I'm very easy to find uh, at shows or on the internet. Okay, Jason, let live. Thank you very much. Great, brother. Thank you.